word on the street is that you used to snowboard. I did. Yeah, I did yeah. five years. I used to compete in all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? You, you mean like, well, how, how far back is this? Because like, I'm not going to lie. Oh. I, as soon as John told me that, I immediately went and Googled Ashley Sinclair snowboarder. And I found like some things that I'm sure are not related to you. But you said you competed. Was this like in high school, college? Like, no. So after university, I, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh-huh. but I never uh-huh. skied or snowboarded when I lived there. So I moved over to the UK when I was 13. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, just finished university and was like, I'm so tired of people telling me what to think and what to do. And so I went to Austria for a summer and did a lot of mountain biking and tried snowboarding and learned learned to snowboard on the glacier basically and then did five consecutive back-to-back winter seasons so I did two in France one in Canada when the winter Olympics were on there so didn't do Whistler unfortunately because it was very expensive and then I did a season in California and then a final one back in France so my last season was 11-12 so it's been 11 years since I've done a season I found myself at 26 quite aimless. I did a degree in media production and script writing. So I always wanted to do writing. I want to be a journalist. And, and you know, that's kind of how I ended up being in marketing because I got a job. I was working in hospitality whilst I was traveling, obviously. Like yeah. Waitress and I was restaurant manager, that sort of thing. Didn't want to do that once I got back because the hours suck and it's just a young man's game and there's no career opportunity there. So yeah, transitioned, got a job as a recruitment consultant, hated it, but was quite good at it, um, but was recruiting for marketers a lot. And so I got a much clearer view of actually like what these people do, what's involved, and and that's how I kind of fell into marketing. I wanted to be a content marketer initially, and then yeah, managed to get a job at Kineo of all places. When you do five seasons, um, after my, my first couple of seasons, I was like, okay, I'm a bit bored of just writing piece. Yeah. Um, and so it just kind of ended up drifting into the the park because of that. And ah. as long as you're prepared to eat shit repeatedly, it, it, I loved it because it was <laughs> it was progression. And you know, I do have an athlete's mindset. I'm very much of the attitude that, you know, there's always room for improvement. And I loved that. I, I loved with snowboarding, and I think it's the same with the business. Like I am my own limiter. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it it isn't a case. I'm grateful for my upbringing in the States. You know, I was very much taught if you believe it, you can achieve it. And so I, I, you know, I I believe if, if I want to accomplish something, it is, I am my own limiter. So I had to get out of my own way and out of my own head in order to progress Mm. snowboarding and not be afraid to fall and get back up and learn what I did wrong and track and try it again and again and again and again and again until you get it right. So I loved that for that, you know, it really, yeah pushed me in a different way. And I think it's all been valuable experience for building a business, to be honest, the resilience piece, especially. Yeah. So you're talking about, you know, you kind of your, your pathway into, you know, competitive snowboarding. And and I, you know, I feel like those, those skills, like you said, have transferred into your business. I'm, I'm curious, you know, shifting from marketing and and going more into the, like the, into the learning space, I guess, was there a transition there? Was it more you just had to adapt to a new role or a new industry or kind of what was the that that journey for you like going from marketing straight into learning and not yet into to, to mass marketing but kind of that transition that you initially made well I mean I think like a lot of people in the l d industry I fell into it you know mm. my, my first marketing role was working at Kineo so mm. I, I I ended up in working in the learning technologies, learning vendor space by accident mm-hmm. and so and kind of unearthed this industry that I didn't even know existed. And most people don't, you know, it's this billion dollar industry that most people are like, huh, what do you do? What is that? Is that a thing I have to do at work that I don't like? Yeah, probably. So, you know, it, it, there wasn't really a transition. All I've done my whole marketing career is learning. You know, I I have my entire tenure in marketing, which is over a decade, has been spent in the learning space. So there was no transition. It's just been kind of, I guess, embracing it whole hog and seeing how little has changed and how much has changed at the same time. So, (laughs) well, well, I guess then what what was your first? So, so you came into this, uh, you found L and D, you, um, and and then what? What what was like the first? Uh, the first red flag that, you know, L&D needed to change or or kind of what was like the first thing that you noticed that that seemed kind of off given uh, your marketing, your marketing background and education? 
Yeah, I mean, very early on, I would say within like the first two years, once I kind of got my head around the industry and what the heck, you know, a MOOC versus an LMS was and all of that. I mean, I know we don't use those MOOC, especially that. I think that term has died a death now. But um, I started to see, you know, we were selling Tatara at the time, I think, when I was working at MindClick back in the day. And I, I used to boggle me that people would like spend quite significant sums of money buying a learning platform or paying you know, a lot for these leaders, you know, blended leadership programs with Kineo and things like, and I'm, we're talking like, you know, six figures, you know, 250 mm-hmm. grand, whatever, blown significant sums on this learning opportunities, learning platforms and tech. And then nothing really would happen. So they would complain about poor, poor learner engagement. They would complain about the fact that people aren't using the tech. They've invested so much money in this. And as a marketer, I was just out there thinking, I don't understand why no one's doing like marketing about this. Like, you you know, no one knows that these things exist. Like you can't mm. just put it out into the ether and expect people to know because you know, like, or because they're an employee, they should care. But that was very much the mindset and still very much is with a lot of people that I speak to. And that for me, I've had the confidence that marketing is a necessity in L&D since about 2015 you know, and I, I, I've been sat on this notion for a long time that actually we need to start thinking much more about how we market our learning products and services and treating our learners like customers and mm-hmm. having the attitude that actually the onus is on us as learning professionals to persuade and influence people to want to learn instead of making this unusual assumption that there is a desire from individuals to want to engage with professional development some do but the majority don't i think there's kind of adding on to that there's the assumption like lmd just classically comes from a place where we get to assign learning where we get to say like hey take time away from your desk and come sit in this classroom or take this e-learning that you know um and you're required to do it or watching you do it will you know look on the back end to see if you accessed it and um it's it's uh, i think i don't think having a lnd is having a necessarily having a reckoning with it now but because they still haven't realized that um people don't have to go to your uh to your training or they don't have to they don't really unless it's really assigned and i i'm curious when you talk about marketing um being in learning i think something that's um, I, I'm curious, kind of what is the, it, it's similar to marketing, like for a pro, maybe to help folks kind of wrap their heads around this, I guess, what is marketing for learning? Is it the same as marketing for a product or, you know, like, should they, everybody just be Apple at their company, at their company when it comes to learning and development? What, what, what does that mean for you? I don't think any of us can be Apple, nor can we be the marketing team behind Barbie. You know, they have incredible multi-million pound budgets that we do not. Um, and they have incredible level of resource and talent behind them from a marketing perspective, not to mention the diverse range of channels that they have available to reach their audiences. L&D contends with a very different and unique challenge in that they are trying to reach a Uh, an audience that's already very inundated with internal comms, you know, coming from the CEO, from HR, from talent, from their managers, whatever it might be, there's already quite a lot of like organizational noise. So the L&D comms that they maybe do put out already to say, oh, here's a new learning module, you got to go do it or whatever, that gets lost straight away. So uh, just to kind of further your point, and then I'll come back to that around, you know, we're used to just being able to kind of prescribe people learning. You know, if you think about the way that learning started or the learning industry started, you know, we we evolved platforms like Blackboard to mm-hmm. that are curricula based, built for universities and the such like structured learning environments where people put their hands up and said, I want to go and learn this and I am going to sign up or pay to go. You're going to get a little bit more engagement because it's even if it's not mandatory at university, people have opted into that experience. And we've we've then somehow adopted that into our organization. So that mindset of people want to do this exists for some reason. So when we talk about marketing for learning, 
it is exactly the same as marketing a product, which is dropping that assumption that people want to learn, that there's an innate desire to develop themselves because they've signed up for something, because guess what? Just because they're an employee doesn't mean they have. And actually understanding, deepening our understanding of our audiences in terms of who they are, what they want, answering the why, right? Good marketing, whether that's business to business, business to consumer, or internal comms, such as what we're talking about in the context of marketing for learning, it all, stuff that's done well has the audience member at the core of everything that they're doing. So we're talking about benefits over features. We're positioning the product in a way that solves challenges, resolves pain points, and meets people's needs, rather than this sort of diagnostic way that we tend to do comms and L&D, which is, here is a thing, and we want you to do it. Mm. Or, or, or the business believes that you have a skills gap. Here, go and do it. And these, these messages don't connect with people. And understandably, people don't engage with it as a consequence. So, mm. you know, it, it's it's a twofold piece marketing. One is making people aware that the thing exists, which is problematic in and of itself. You would not believe how many conversations I have with learners through discovery that don't even know the wealth of learning opportunities that are available to them. And once they know it exists, there's got to be an effort around actually keeping your marketing opportunity, sorry, learning opportunities front of mind through marketing. So, you know, a cadence, a consistent message over time, keeping front of mind so that when people have a learning need, they go to you instead of YouTube or Google, right? Mm. It, it's a, I've seen this being thrown a, a, around a lot that, you know, training as an event needs to die, right? That's the, this idea that you're going to you're going to come to this workshop or this training with a um, a skill in mind, and uh, once you leave our workshop or you know our webinar or training, whatever you're you're going to know how to do that. But I, it's I done. Kind of, yeah, that's it. It's yeah, perfect. It, exactly. If if, <laughs> if only, only. <laughs> it's if like the only. matrix. Just plug exactly. you in, and you're all set. Well, I, I'm I'm very open to that idea, but I don't think the tech is there just yet. <laughs> um, Me too. <laughs> but. I'm I'm curious, like, so, so I I think that's that's philosophically why L and D has a has a problem or, or doesn't understand kind of you know, their relationship with users. But then, if they were to then let's say if we were to snap our fingers tomorrow and L and D were to stop kind of producing content and instead like take a moment and really dive in with the audience and figure out what's useful, what's needed for them. I guess then what are the what are the tools that they, what are the tools that they need? Like, are, are we, and maybe we can start high level. Like, you know, is there, um, uh, is there a, a, such an idea as, do you just borrow the marketing funnel and apply that to learning? Like, is there any sort of differentiation? And, and you know, we can get into kind of how you maybe work. If you have an example, that'd be helpful. But I guess, what is the marketing funnel? What are some of the other tools or that you use to apply to learning? Or do you just borrow straight from how you'd market a product? Yeah, we beg, steal, borrow, basically. You know, I, I I tell you what, you can Google marketing stuff and just change the word consumer to learner and it pretty much applies for the most part. This mm -hmm. is this is the thing. We think we're special and we're not. You know, it, it, we are just marketing stuff to people. We are selling a product to people. So mm. what do we have to do? We need to understand who they are. So to my mind, there's a very clear process and and a, I, I, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've built like a, like a fake one of that basically where a marketing's hierarchy of needs there are things that need to be in place and in a certain order in order for marketing to like really work and to be effective mm -hmm. first and foremost your learning needs to be like pretty good or at least robust or you need to have an understanding of what your learning is right so we don't want a situation where you have a dusty old LMS that's 20 years old uh, and you've got a load of storyline content in there that hasn't been touched. And, uh, you know, it, it's 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 legacy content that's not modern. It's not appropriate for the learner need and mm -hmm. it's not going to actually help people acquire any knowledge or apply it on the job. So your product needs to be in a good place before you market it, in my opinion. Now, I know not everyone can have the all singing, all dancing, bells and whistles learning experience. If you don't, be real with what it is that you've got because you mm. don't want to go out and overpromise and underdeliver. You don't want to go out with a really cool campaign and say like, hey, we've got this amazing thing, get people all excited. And then they go to that experience and it's not what you've sold them because yeah. that will that will breach trust 
and it will disengage audiences way more than if you just didn't do anything until you got your ducks in a row. So we need to make sure that our learning opportunities and our learning experiences are as good as they can be within the parameters of our organization. We need to, we need to do the housekeeping first. Can, can we pause there for a second? Because I think that's really critical. Like, I think if, if somebody were to say like, hey, I'm going to use Ashley's, uh, Ashley's approach to marketing, with, I'm going to start using Ashley's approach to marketing within my organization, but they don't even know if they have useful content, you know, that's kind of a non-starter for you, you at, you know, with marketing as a service, you can't market something that doesn't, um, that doesn't work or isn't good. So is this a process that you go through with the client of auditing what's good versus not, or this is marketable versus not? How do you kind of walk them through that process? Because you're coming to a client and they already have their content. They're just like, help us with marketing. So uh, I, I guess, what kind of work do you do with them to, to get it all started? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely not learning strategists, and I certainly wouldn't wouldn't like to say that I know the ins and outs of, mm. you know, instructional design and pedagogy. And, you know, I'm not a, a learning experience designer, and I'm not mm. a learning strategist. What I am is a really great marketer. And so we're typically brought in, like, you know, I won't say the company name, but I've been having a conversation with a gentleman and a, a large organization. And he came to me about six months ago and was like, we're thinking about doing this. And I was like, just pause there, like go and do X, <laughs> Y, and Z. And, you know, he showed, he showed me lots of stuff that they had planned. And I said, you need to have all of this in order before we'll have a valuable conversation because mm -hmm. otherwise you're put in the horse before the cart. And, you know, we do something with clients a lot called a value proposition canvas. And it's actually used when you're developing business plans. I went on an accelerator a few years ago and I was like, that's mint. And I've totally adjusted it for l d but not really at all. It's just a really useful tool and template to assess our understanding of what it is that we offer to our learners. So on one side, you've got like the features of your learning opportunities, the experience that your people have and the benefits of it. And on the other side, it talks about your audience's pains and fears, their wants, their needs, their desires, et cetera in the hopes that we have a more objective view of what it is that we're actually offering and what our mm. people want slash need and expect from learning. And hopefully in, in a dream world, there's some sort of lovely Venn diagram where there's some overlap and we can see some opportunities. We need to do that level of objective introspection that isn't being done in L&D. We don't often actually take a bird's eye view of like, oh, what is this experience actually like for our people? What does that feel like? What, you know, what do we have to offer you know, what, where's the why in our L and D? Is it just so we offer learning? There's nothing to latch onto with that. Mm. So we need, you know, th this foundational work around actually like deepening our understanding of our product, but also really deepening our understanding of our audiences through things like the value proposition canvas and also development of learner personas. And there's tons of information on our blog and on our podcast about how to actually do that effectively. Um, it is not job titles. It's a lot more than that. <laughs> if I see another persona, that's just someone's job title. I swear to God. So yeah, I you know there have this is the kind of foundational stuff before you can do really good marketing strategy, right? You got to understand yeah. your product. You got to understand your market. You got to understand your audience. This person who you know had these grand ideas, who you said, "Hey, listen, pause, take a moment." What was the what was the signal to you? Or what did you see? Did, did they say something? Did you see something that made you think immediately, hey, you're not ready to start building your marketing plan? They were still building out their learning strategy. So Can ultimately, mm -hmm. yeah. So ultimately, they aren't quite clear on what it is that they're doing. So to put it in marketing terms, they're not ready to go to market yet because they're still developing the product. Mm -hmm. So until the product is ready, Mm -hmm. in it, in, and I get that, okay, of course, like our learning offering is probably a, a constantly moving and adjusting thing. But if you're in a, a period, a state of change and an adjustment, you need to at least be clear on how that's going to be communicated to your audiences if mm -hmm. you want to go to mark, doing marketing around that, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a change management piece rather than just a marketing piece. So to me, it doesn't have to be everything, you know, dotted and signed on the dotted line and signed, sealed, delivered, but you need to be very clear about your position within the business and what your learning offering is before you can communicate that with your audiences. Because if you're not clear on that, they're never going to be 
let's be honest. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that stuff, there needs to be much more clarity around, okay, what are we doing? What's happening this year? What's available to our audiences? How are they going to get the, you know, all that stuff needs to be sorted first because Mm. otherwise you're going to start sending a lot of people there and it's going to be a very, very confused, disjointed experience. And they will show you their disinterest with their feet. (laughs) Fair enough. Okay. So let's say in, 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 if we're, if we're, at the stage where we have a clear go-to-market strategy for our learning product. And I, I don't know why I just put my fingers up. We're going to put them back down for our learning product. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the first step to building a, an effective marketing plan? Well, first of all, I think my gesticulation is contagious. So that's probably why you put your hands that's up. That's exactly what happened. That. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just mirroring. Yeah. So bu- building out, um, well, good. That's, that's good body language. That's fine. Um, Building out a marketing plan is a, a very important process. So typically, I'll tell you what we do with clients. And obviously, if people want to do this in-house, it's a slight adjustment. There's got to be a period of discovery. Um, and this may be where you do your personas, where you develop your value proposition canvas, you understand your product in terms of you know market positioning, i.e. where does it sit within the organization? What role does it play in the employee value proposition? You know, how does it sit within HR and talent and the people landscape and all of that stuff? Once you're kind of clear of the dynamics of that, it's really about kind of understanding, well, starting with your goal is the thing that we always start with. So people will often tell us like, well, how do we build out a campaign? Like, well, what are you trying to achieve? You know, a lot, and again, a lot of people can't answer that question. But learning, we want people to learn. Okay, what does that look like? Is that making you know the seventy-five percent of your audience that don't know about anything more aware? You know, because we can't make them all aware and make them all incredible learners in one fell swoop. You know, again, this is a, a stepped process. So, identifying your goals and what it is that you're trying to achieve from marketing. Then and how that obviously conversely feeds into your learning outcomes is a a really important first step. So whether that is raising wider awareness, um, you know, a lot of our clients come to us wanting to shift perceptions of the L&D brand. It's got a a reputation that's kind of gotten out of control for one reason or another, and and L&D aren't owning the narrative in the organization. And so people make up their own minds. Um, and also, I would say the panacea or what most people aspire to is having a culture of self-driven learning where people are proactively pursuing learning of their own volition because they see and understand the value of it from a, mm-hmm. an organizational perspective, but also from a personal and professional perspective. So understanding what you're trying to achieve is a vital first step. From there, you need to. Oh, Sorry, go actually, ahead. because that that's really ju- uh, I think that's a really juicy topic is like analyzing the perceptions of the L and D brand, and then kind of the first step being you know acknowledging that you want to change that perception of L and D in your organization. Do Do you have a um, maybe um, a, a recent example where you kind of went th- took somebody through that transformation a little bit, or you kind of led them through that of of how. Um, how to change the percept the, the brand of LD because I, I think it's like you're t- like you were mentioned at the beginning of this conversation it's we have these old ways of thinking or we think we assign learning or we're not thinking about uh learners I think that is kind of the the current state of a lot of LD teams so like how you know what's an example of kind of a before and after transformation that a client was looking for yeah so I think the the reality is this this stuff takes time. You know, we're yeah. affecting people's hearts and minds. So sometimes I think both clients on the B2B side, when we were doing more work with vendors, we don't do so much now intentionally, but um people want quick results and marketing doesn't often garner that. You know, the mm-hmm. the, the stuff, the really juicy stuff where you're actually changing people's hearts and minds, affecting emotions takes time, you know, change management projects span up to two years for a reason, because that's how long it takes to affect change. So if we're really looking at changing cultures, you know, there needs to be, first of all, rather than looking at quick kill campaigns. So what we'll often see if marketing and comms is being done in l and is, oh, uh, we've got this thing that's happening. We better send, oh, we better send some emails out and do an all hands and let the CEO know so they can send an email or let, you know, that it's it's always a flurry of activity. So you get a spike in activity and then it drops off. What mm. we're really terrible at in LD is consistently 
marketing meaningful content that's relevant to people um, that isn't necessarily always just go to the platform and do some learning. So a lot of our strategic work with clients on that kind of, you know, bigger brand building piece. And we're doing a big project at the moment with a client that is is very, very much about this and they've got a university. And so we're looking at kind of how to introduce that more widely to the organization, but how to actually get people more um, involved in the process and and more willing to do it of their own volition. And, you know, a big part of that is there's there's a couple of things. One is educating the learning function on the importance of marketing and how to do it well and unifying that because what we'll often find is there's maybe one or two people in a learning team who really get what I'm gobbling on about here and Mm -hmm. and yeah okay this is actually really important we do need to think about the learner we need to answer the what's in it for me maybe they don't have the skills to eloquently execute it in copywriting or or imagery and things like that but you can learn those skills but the whole team needs to be singing from the same hidden sheet. So that's a, that's a, that's an mm-hmm. important starting point. So oftentimes in tandem with strategic work that we're doing, we'll, we'll be doing upskilling through bespoke workshops or our masterclass to actually give L and D those skills and break down some of those uh, mental silos that we have, particularly around our learning versus marketing mindset, which are quite different. So that's a really, really important first step, I think is actually doing some housekeeping close to home mm-hmm. stuff making sure that we're all on the same page. And then, you know, I can't talk too much about results and specific clients, but what I can say is if you're looking at actually affecting learning culture, then you need to be looking at campaigns that span two, one to two years, you know, 12 to 18 mm. months, you know, we mm-hmm. can, you know, we, we, we use a couple of different models. One's called hum sing shout, and there's another one called the long and short of it. These are both marketing models that talk about uh, release cadences. So hum sing shout is basically, if you imagine different volumes of noise, uh, hum is kind of your brand activities. That's your BAU, that stuff that's kind of just ticking along underneath quietly. Mm-hmm. Whereas your, your sing stuff is maybe shorter kill campaigns. So I would see those as uh, maybe specific learning events or initiatives that you have and your shouts might be uh, much more about, you know, launching the new L and D brand to the business and actually kind of owning that narrative. Mm-hmm. There needs to be a consistent level of noise over a prolonged period of time to mm-hmm. keep the learning function front of mind. But that comms can't just be focused on learning. It can't just be go and do this thing. We've got this for you. This is what's available now. It needs to be around the personas, needs to be around the emotional drivers, the why, you know, starting to actually add credibility, proving value, you know, things like user generated content, social proof, stuff like that to really actually solidify in people's minds that this is useful and this is value, but it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it just it just can't. And people take a long time to be persuaded, especially if there is a lot of legacy beliefs. And and if the organization has has a lot of people that stay for a long time, you can you know, you have got a a fight on your hands to really crack into their minds. It's possible, but it does require consistency. It's it's uh, reestablishing trust in the brand it's uh, very much saying you know we were this way it, it's there this reminds me is, is do you know when i think of the, these things like building trust over time often if you've wronged someone it's it starts with an apology um is there you know is that fed into the messaging or is 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 that part of kind of the arc how, how much of the arc do they own or is it just like hey from now on we're going to start we weren't consistent before we're going to start being consistent now or or is there like an event like a new launch uh let's say if you're doing like the the shout and you're owning the narrative do you take business or do you take uh learning teams through that um through that kind of pace like where they reintroduce themselves to the organization or is this something where it's like hey you don't have to go with something big we can start small and and move incrementally a lot of it comes down to what's going, what has happened, what has mm-hmm. been done up to that point, and also what's going on in the organization. Like one of my clients was recently launching an LXP, a new LXP, but there was also like four other systems being launched business-wide within mm-hmm. like six weeks of that. So mm-hmm. 
there was a kind of a school of thought of like, maybe we just do like a self launch and wait for some of the noise to mellow out before we try and compete with all of that. So again, that's, that's why that discovery piece that I mentioned earlier, whether, whether you're doing it with an external person like myself, or you're doing it yourselves and consulting with the business and acting as business partners to actually more deeply understand what's going on within the business. That that's really, really vital to understand what your strategy should be because Mm. actually if if there's a big change management initiative that's going on um in the business then you might need to make connections with that a good example actually was a a client of mine we we'd done a campaign we'd done training in tandem with the strategy and we were pretty much signed off with all the assets and everything We're, we're just about ready to go and then they they buzzed me and said uh, you need to meet with internal comms because they're mm. they're they're doing some sort of initiative and they want to align all of the comms across the business with their kind of overarching brand strategy for internal comms. So we had to change the tagline, we had to change a lot of the imagery and everything so that it was still it was still aligned with with the business. So ultimately, I guess what I'm trying to say is you need to understand what's going on and what's happening before you can develop a strategy in terms of okay, well, you know, what do we know is happening this year? So like, if I'm going to do a marketing strategy, like I'll be like, okay, we're going to learning live next month. We know that learning technologies is in May. We know that August and Christmas are dead zones and we don't touch those times much for marketing, the so on and so forth. So, you know, you can almost map out a bit of a plan in terms of events and things that you know are happening, but again, you'll need to coordinate with other stakeholders in the business, such as internal comms, marketing, Mm. branding, HR, talent, people, PNC, whatever it might be, because these these are all also going to be putting comms out. And so mm-hmm. the more unified you can be, the better. Um, but you also need to be mindful of the level of noise that you're creating and how that sits in amongst, you know, as a learner or an individual at an, at an organization, how much noise am I being hit with? Because again, mm. understanding that can allow you to temper your approach it can affect what channels you might use it can impact the types of content that you might do like if you know there's a lot of comms coming out via email well balls to it, i'll start creating video you know, yeah. what's going to stand out do you know what i mean so this level of research like a big part of our strategic work with clients isn't the marketing strategy document it's all of this work it's all of the the really getting under the skin of the dynamics of the organization the culture of the business the attitudes towards L and D, L and D's attitudes towards itself. Um, and also, you know, that that learning ecosystem and the learning landscape as a whole. So, you know, people, if people want to start thinking big picture marketing, change, mm-hmm. learning culture stuff, this is the big piece of work that needs to be done. A, a huge and significant significant level of introspection to actually mm-hmm. understand what is going on in the business and how do people think and feel about us. Because mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. the only way you, you can only then change positioning once you know what people think about you, really. Mm-hmm, Otherwise, mm-hmm. it is just a stab in the dark. Okay, so so if we're gonna we're we're gonna start to tie this all, in, and I understand I keep asking questions because I'm curious. But if we're gonna continue this process, so we we've done maybe something of a content audit. Make made sure first and foremost is have a good product. Second is it's time to do discovery. Figure out what the big picture is. Who are the stakeholders? How do we contribute? You know, kind of what is what is the current level of noise or what is the type of music? What's that tune that's being played across the business? Kind of what is the story and where do we fit in? And understanding um, just the the everything, the, the big picture of the business and where uh, learning products fit currently in there, um, whether that's mm-hmm. for, for better or for worse. What is like the next major phase for you? Yeah, so once you've kind of done that and deep into this, so definitely do personas. And I would recommend some sort of process or workshop where where you actually understand the dynamics of your learning offering, and you know, not not just not just a content audit in terms of here's what we've got, but actually like how is that perceived by the learner, and mm-hmm. is that is that a value or is that relevant to them, or is that all being created because the business told you to, and they don't give a crap about any of it? That's probably more of the case. So you know, again, this whole process gives you a view of like what's actually valuable to my people. You know, mm-hmm. what do they what do they put equity in or you know, mm-hmm. where, where do they perceive opportunity? What what do they at work for? What do they want? What do they need? Because all of this answers your questions in terms of positioning. You know, who how do we go go to market in inverted mm-hmm. commas with our product as good as it can be within the parameters of our organization? 
what what's gonna what's gonna hook people in you know mm. what, what's gonna actually get eyes on us until we understand people's challenges and pain points we're never going to be able to communicate that you know all, all the best marketing talks to emotional drivers so identifying maybe a couple of clear pain points across the organization in terms and how your learning absolves those is is going to be a really great place to start in terms of determining positioning um, and then you need to obviously think about what channels you have so mm-hmm. lnd usually has generally speaking email uh usually there's some sort of social platform be that teams or yammer mm-hmm. or something like that sometimes they have uh static channels such as offices screens in offices things like that posters and the such like um and then obviously one of the most widely overlooked channels is people and other stakeholders in the business, such as managers, your C-suite, uh, HR business partners or learning business partners, that's the such like. Understanding the the mechanism or the vehicle to get your, your message out is another really important part of planning because we tend to just default to email. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's still, you know, I think it's an undervalued and underestimated channel. It can still be very good. It is still the best performing channel in B2B for a reason. But you got to make your 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 efforts on those channels really well if you've only got three channels well you better do them damn well right Mm -hmm. so I think you know that that's the next step is actually understanding how what is my message going to be that's actually going to connect with people what's going to create resonance you know Mm -hmm. what's actually going to answer their uh challenges and pain points you know pain pain aversion is a is a thing people will willingly uh avoid pain over pursuing pleasure mm-hmm. um you know there there's a lot of research around that and so tapping into pain points is the most effective way to market to people mm. you'll, you'll see it constantly on any product like oh it, it's faster it's more efficient it gives you you know th- these are all they're not features they're benefits so making sure you answer that and you're getting your messaging right is really important but then how do you get that message out there what's the vehicle for that message is it email is it you know, Yammer? Is it videos? Is it user generated content? Is it webinars? Is it podcasts? Whatever. Um, But that that needs to be your kind of next question. And then from there, really, it's developing a a cadence, you know, communications cadence of, Mm. you know, how long is this campaign going to last? You know, please do it for at least three months. People do for like two weeks. And I'm like, no, learning at work week angers me. Um, a week doesn't do much. So, you know, that that's the next thing is actually how do we use these channels um, to keep front of mind with people consistently over a period of time. A lot of my clients will push back to me sometimes when we've done a plan for them because it looks like so much content. When you look at mm-hmm. it on like a spreadsheet of like week to week, here, this, here, this. But you got to remember that people don't see everything you put out. Yep. You know, email open rates are what on average 18, 22%, something like that. So when you start to really break it down, people, not everybody sees copy, every. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. A good. That's just an open rate. So if you've got a good subject line, um. So yeah. So you know, we need to be real with the fact that whilst look us looking at a body of marketing, a campaign mm. content looks incredibly large. Actually, it's essential for keeping us front of mind. Marketing's rule of seven says that someone needs to see a brand seven times before they'll even recall or remember it. So. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why we need to have campaigns that span a longer period of time over a range of channels um, and not really just the same thing being said over and over again either. You know, we just can't use the same imagery repeatedly, can't use the same subject lines, the same posts because people get tired of it. They ignore mm-hmm. it because they think mm-hmm. they've already seen it. And and then how do you evaluate these campaigns? I mean, is again, this is you're borrowing one to one from you know marketing strategy one to one, but in the learning space, I mean, does that change? Or um, I guess what is what is growth or engage? You know, it, I guess it also depends on if their goal is growth or engagement or you know increasing brand awareness. But um, which sounds like you decide up front with with a uh, with a client before you launch these uh, multi month campaigns. But um, I guess w- what is the 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 difference that they they see, or what is the difference that they're that you've that you're kind of leading them to look for. Mm. Yeah. So again, it is, is especially aligned to that goal. So Mm -hmm. first of all, benchmarking must be happening much more than it is. You know, we encourage our clients to benchmark. We'll work with them to put KPIs in place, whether they do or not. 
is a different story because mm. I, we do still seem very wary of data in our industry. I don't know if that's because we're worried it's going to make us look bad or we don't really feel we have the skills to interpret it effectively. But we don't always seem to be that inclined to measure the efficacy of our efforts, which, again, as a marketer who's constantly or used to be constantly under scrutiny from my CEO as to well, what, what's this done? When you spent this, what does that get you? You know, we're yeah. under that scrutiny in L&D so much. That being said, there there's a couple of things that are really important to remember. Now, marketing is intrinsically linked to learning. So it isn't as simple as we're going to do some marketing and people are going to go buy a product. It's, it's really easy to measure like, oh, I sent out these emails. This many people opened that email. They clicked on it. They went on the website and X amount of people bought it. And I can see all that with my tracking codes in Google. And life's really easy for me as a marketer to evidence that. We don't have that tech um, in l &D. And also we've got a, an additional challenge, which is marketing makes people aware that something exists. And marketing can encourage engagement with learning repeatedly mm -hmm. over a period of time. What it can't do is make people learn because that's down to the product. That's down to the learning experiences. So as an external marketer, our hands are somewhat tied in terms of the success of learning because mm -hmm. that's not a product that we have any visibility over. So what we do tend to look at in a, in a dream world, I would typically map out KPIs ac across that kind of awareness um, consideration and decision making. So that sales funnel that you briefly alluded to earlier. So, you know, engagement stats, benchmark, first of all, draw a line in the sand, be very, very clear where you are now before mm -hmm. you start something. Because again, how do you know where you are if you don't know where you've been? So we need to benchmark first and foremost, draw that line in the sand, look at things like, well, first of all, what data do you have? What data mm -hmm. do you have access to? What data can you get access to? Most of us have a learning platform, so we can see things like views, visits, completions, time, you know, things like that. If you put Google Analytics under that, you get some insights around dwell time, um, you know, repeat visits, things like that. It has got slightly less because GA4 has come in and the cookie issue has reduced some of the visibility that we get to see now as marketers. But nevertheless, it will give you some further insights that your LMS won't. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be if it were me and I was doing a campaign and I knew I was looking at email, I don't know, a social channel uh, and trying to get people to my learning platform to undertake, I don't know, let's just be really, really simple with it. A, a new e-learning module that we've got. That's, mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend doing a campaign around that, but for argument's sake, for sure. simplicity. Um, so I'd be looking at monitoring things like uh, click through or open rates on my emails. So again, open rate is quite difficult to measure because most learning functions don't have an email sending platform in ESP, such as MailChimp or uh, HubSpot or the such like to actually be able to just, oh, 29.3% of people open this email. We don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is use things like UTM codes and tracking links like Bitly to mm -hmm. open click through. So mm -hmm. to monitor click through. So again, you can play around with your copy and, and um, start to see if you're getting more click through. Um, also, you know, engagement stats on your social posts and things like that can be really, really useful. So those are some kind of very simple um, engagement mm -hmm. stats that you could look at as a starting point, but also other things such as visits to the LMS, um, learning undertaken. Again, I hate learning hours, but it can give you at least some insight into the level of interest someone has in learning. Mm -hmm. um, and again, repeat visits, I would be very interested in. Are people coming back? How many mm -hmm. new people are we reaching versus how many people are coming back? Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously with the, the ultimate goal that this does feed down into learning outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, performance outcomes, not just not learning as an event, it's done, but actually like, and this again is down to L&D, but has the learning actually impacted performance because it's marketing learning performance, right? We're making them aware they're doing the thing, but are they then applying the thing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways it's going to count when it comes to data. We are limited in terms of what we can measure in L&D, but that doesn't mean that there isn't spaces and places where we can benchmark and draw lines in the sand. I think what I would say is make sure that those are aligned to the goals that you're trying to achieve. And it's very clear that those will show or not whether mm -hmm. the campaign has been successful. Yeah, I, I, 
you know, it's it's making sure it, it sounds like it's it's just making sure that that goal is lined all the way to and through to the end of the campaign. And like you said, you got to work with the data that you have. Um, I think that something that I I find encouraging that you said is uh, is you know, if your goal is to get people to go into your LMS, then that's what the then that's what you build that campaign around. Or if your goal is what you know for that new e learning module that you have, because I think a lot of folks are are still uh, at least in the L and D space are saying are still very uh, platform focused where they're saying like, you know, we should do away with the LMS. And I, I think in some, in a lot of cases that, that is, you know, if that's the way you've done things before, maybe it is time to move things off of your LMS, but you're saying like, work with what you got. You got to know yeah. where your data, where your data is coming from. And if those are the tools that you have, rather than make these huge decisions about what piece of tech we're going to adopt now or not, it's, find out what data you have, make realistic goals, and then measure around that. So I, I do find that heartening. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, for those folks who, I, I, I talk to a lot of folks who, the idea of marketing, having a marketing mindset or a product mindset in learning and development is new. Uh, for mm. those folks who are new to um, marketing as a mindset or a marketing approach, short of hiring mass marketing, what is one thing that they could do in order to, you know, start so that they could start thinking in this way tomorrow or start thinking about marketing in a, in a learning space. Your learners are human beings. Treat them as such. It's that simple. You know, I, I think that sometimes I, I see this attitude almost like, I don't know, our, our people, our employees are like these kind of like metrons that just kind of come to work and I love working and I love learning and you know they're they're human beings and they've got families and kids and health issues and you know poorly grandmas and dogs they gotta walk and kids they gotta feed and I think breaking down that attitude alone you know mm. leaving that curricula oriented attitude that I alluded to earlier where actually people want to learn if we leave if we park that and we start from a place of actually these people are human beings and they probably don't want to learn mm -hmm. it. That shift alone will completely affect our outlook to how we build learning mm -hmm. and how we try to engage with our audiences, because we're not starting from a place of these people want to do this. It's just a case of me letting them know it's actually like, oh, okay. And they don't know about it and they probably don't want to do it even if they do know about it. So I've got to really think long and hard about how I, how I actually interact with these people in a way that's meaningful and relevant and valuable with them. You know, I've got mm. to build trust with these people. They don't know me from Adam. You know, I, like when I launched Mass, no, I mean, some people knew who I was as a marketer on the vendor side, but it's a completely new concept. I've spent four years touting the idea and the notion that a lack of marketing is a problem. And actually, I have a solution. So, you know, it's almost like problem ideation. Sometimes people don't know the problems that they don't know they have until you make it obvious to them. So, you know, a lot of people think I don't need to learn. Like, you know, I, we see this a lot. People who work in businesses a long time. I know everything there is to know about this business. I don't need to learn. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people going, yeah, yeah. I have a, a big group of people that are in my business that have that attitude. We've got to show them that there's something that they don't know. You've got to prove value. You've got to build trust. You know, and so starting from a place of actually these people are human beings. They still have wants, needs, and they need to understand the benefits of your learning before they'll ever transact with you through their time. That's mm. that is the 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 fact of the matter, really. Mm. You, you gotta know who who you're talking to. And I I, I like that, you know, as the I I saw a quote recently that was like, as the tech is getting, you know, in ref is in reference to generative AI, but as, as the tech gets better, as a, um, as the tech gets, I, I'm misquoting already, but it's essentially as the tech gets better. Yeah. As the <laughs> tech gets better, then uh, the humans, the tech gets better at being good tech. The humans need to be get, uh, get better at being good humans. And so a lot more EQ, a lot more empathy and a lot more just understanding, like you said, pain aversion, but also like their lives. And, and I, I know that you're very active about promoting uh, the persona, which I think is something that is, um, 
I think I've seen a lot of folks who are saying, oh, we don't need personas. We need to know what they're doing, jobs to be done framework. And I think that has its role as well. But I know mm. that you really harp on who are the people we're trying to affect. And so that's winning the hearts and minds and getting them to your product. And so um, speaking about things that people want, this is a really loose transition, but if people want to get in touch with you, Ashley, well, um, and mass marketing, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Ashley Sinclair. We've got a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify called the Marketing for Learning Podcast. So if you want to actually learn more about what I've talked to today, but in a lot more detail, there's, I think, about 55 episodes on there now. Um, and on top of that, we've got our website, which there's a lot of information. Some of the podcasts are on there, lots of blogs and um, eBooks and the such like as well. And that's mass, M-A-A-S hyphen marketing dot co dot UK. Okay, and we'll be sure to drop that in the show notes below. But um, otherwise, Ashley, can't thank you enough for stopping by to, to chat to us and really uh, had some valuable nuggets there. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Lovely to speak with you, Kevin.